members of the United States House of Representatives have voted to create a commission to find out what happened at the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021. I speak exclusively with United States Congressman William Timmons for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close Ups on Facebook. Congressman William Timmons, welcome to the award-winning Quentin's Close Ups. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it greatly. Obviously, you're a United States Congressman for the upstate of South Carolina. You're also a member of the Financial Committee and the, moderns, uh, the Modernized Committee, the community that is. Who else is Congressman Timmons these days? Well, uh, I'm also in the National Guard. I'm a JAG officer. That takes up a good bit of time. I just finished uh, a master's in cybersecurity from NYU. I graduated yesterday. So um, I'm, happy that's, I'm happy that's behind me. Uh, my wife told me I can't get any more graduate degrees until I pay the last one off. So that's good. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm married. Uh, I've been married for uh, two years coming in, in July. And I joke that if you were married during COVID, it counts for at least five years. Um, you know, you, you get extra credit. Um, and, you know, I used to be an athlete. I, I got a number of businesses. I have a CrossFit gym. Um, I played tennis in college. And so uh, I, I've tried to stay in shape, but this job makes it tough. But, you know, I'm just trying to do my best. There's a lot going on, and it's been a tough year and a half, but uh, I think things are looking up. Well, let me rewind time to, obviously, when the president had his not unofficial State of the Union. Let me ask you a blunt question, Congressman. The State of the Union is? Well, it was actually the joint address. It wasn't a State of the Union, but... Right. Um, you know, I think we're in a tough time right now. We're coming out of a pandemic and there's a lot of decisions that we have to make about how to do that. And um, we got to get back to work and we got to get our economy back moving again. We got some longstanding issues. I mean, immigration is a big, a big challenge that we have not addressed for years. And that's Congress's fault. I mean, you know, the executive branch can only do so much. Um, Congress needs to act there. Uh, we got health care challenges. We got energy challenges. I mean, we're in a tough time, but again, I, I do think that things are looking up. I think that we have an opportunity here to, to come together and work on some of these policies in Congress. And um, my, most of my time is spent on the modernization committee. I, I think that that is an area that um, is definitely will pay dividends. Um, so I invest a lot of my time there and hope that we can make Congress a little bit more uh, less dysfunctional, more functional, however you want to put it. But um yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm hopeful still. Let me dive into the issues. As you know, last night, the House passed, obviously, a bipartisan support on, obviously, the House uh, Committee for the investigation on January 6th. And I know in a statement to WBTW News 13 up in the Grand Strand, Congressman Rice says this, the part of the bipartisan committee would present the quote, the facts and causes of the event in order to secure our capital and ensure our democracy remains intact for future generations. How do you secure the capital, Congressman, and ensure democracy in the future? Well, so the, I fully support a, a bipartisan commission that is identical to the 9-11 commission. Unfortunately, the bill that we voted on last night is uh, has some slight modifications that give me pause that it, it will be partisan and not, not actually achieve the objective. I, I do hope that the Senate will make some tweaks to it and that we may actually uh, get it done, but that remains to be seen. Um, so how do you secure the Capitol? I, I've always been blown away that people were able to break into the United States Capitol with a flagpole. I mean, you know, the, the fact that I just had no idea that the windows on the lower part of the Capitol facing the Washington Monument were hundreds of years old. And uh, I just think that that's inexcusable. Um, I believe that we should spend all resources necessary to make the Capitol look no different than it did two years ago, but be impenetrable. I mean, uh, putting hurricane glass uh, in, in the place of any, you know, hundred year old glass and um, making it to where you can harden the building without knowing it's hardened. This is not hard. I mean, it is not challenging. We just need to spend the money to do it. Um, I, I hope that we can find a path forward uh, quickly, but um, like I said, we're pretty dysfunctional right now. So I guess that remains to be seen. Let me, let me just ask you this. What role did your rhetoric play in the events that culminated into one of the most horrific days in American history? 
I was very careful with what I said. Um, I, I don't think that I said anything that was uh, incendiary or insightful. Um, I still have strong concerns about the election modifications made in certain states in the run-up to the November election. And that's why we're still seeing states fix a lot of those uh, changes that were not constitutionally made, whether it's uh, Georgia, Arizona, uh, Pennsylvania's even changing their, their election laws. So, you know, the what happened on January 6th is a tragedy and awful, and I condemn it, and I mean, in the strongest terms, but the, the reason that um, people are upset regarding the November election, um, it, the president just overly simplified it. You know, he said, stop the steal. I'm like, Mr. President, that's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about unconstitutional changes to election laws in swing states that were intentionally done uh, by a bunch of people from DC. So, you know, it's, it's not easy to explain and the president, former president likes to simplify things. So um, I, I still think we're gonna be dealing with the ramifications of changing election laws uh, through executive branch and through bureaucratic fiat for the, the next coming years. But we need to have confidence in our election outcomes and election integrity is everything. And uh, I think that everybody can agree on that. So I hope we can work on that together. But let me ask you this, Dan. Did President Biden rightfully won the election? win the election yeah i mean i i i would say he did but you know my, my challenge is this let me turn that around for you the question is was there any um election fraud in the november election i can't answer that uh i, I don't i don't know i i have a bunch of evidence where people voted that shouldn't have been able to i mean tens of thousands does is that enough to change the outcome of the election probably not but w when somebody that is very passionate on the other side of that issue says something to me, I can't give them the assurances that I should be able to. And that's a problem. That's a problem. So, uh, I mean, look, the president uh, in, the, in the White House is the president in the White House. Um, we should never have this problem again. It is, it is a tragedy. It is, it is wrong that we had this problem uh, this past cycle. I didn't do that. The people that did that need to be held accountable. You can't change the election laws uh, in the weeks before the election. COVID is an excuse. It's not a reason. And um, we got to get the confidence back in our election integrity. And I'm going to be working to do that. Um, so well, let me ask you this. Obviously, you talked about the president a few minutes ago. How do you ensure that the president is accountable for his actions on that particular day? Uh, you know, I think that the president bringing hundreds of thousands of people to Washington that are really mad at the election changes uh, is something that, I mean, there's culpability in a lot of different areas. Uh, there's culpability for the speaker for not having sufficient security at the Capitol to allow people to get past the barricades and into the building. Uh, there's culpability for certain members of Congress who used extremely insightful language. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that is coming uh, out in the, 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 days and weeks in the uh, past January 6th. And I think we'll continue to understand that more. But, um, you know, I, I think the president has every right to be mad about the unconstitutional changes to election laws in these states. Now, he simplified it, stop steal, which is probably not the best way of doing that. But he can, he can be mad in a simple way, and I can be mad in a more complex and articulate way. Well, let me ask you this. Was January 6th a protest or was it a riot or was it anarchy? I think it was uh, originally a uh, protest that turned into, uh, in portions, and anybody that entered the Capitol became uh, rioters at the very least, but, uh, you know, maybe seditionists, maybe insurrectionists. Um, but, you know, I, I think that there were still tens of thousands of people that never entered the Capitol, that never intended to enter the Capitol. Um, but like I said, anybody that entered the Capitol, I, I think you're going to get in trouble and you should get in trouble. And anyone that in, engaged in violence with law enforcement is going to go to jail and they should. And I will do everything I can to prosecute anyone that broke any law to the fullest extent possible. But again, I mean, th there were hundreds of people in the Capitol. There were tens of thousands of people outside the Capitol. If you didn't assault law enforcement and if you didn't uh, break, break into the Capitol, then you were just there to uh, 
protest the election results. And uh, so it, it's a little bit of all of the above. Do you fully support law enforcement? Uh, One million percent. And let me get back to obviously. Hey, your, I'm sorry. Um, this was scheduled for five minutes. I'll give you. How about one more minute? Go ahead. Well, uh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Let me go to another thing here. Are you after last night's vote? Are you afraid of the midterms? No, not at all. Um, I, I would bet uh, any any amount of money that the Republicans will retake the House. Um, you know, I, I think that. Uh, between redistricting and historical data based on midterm elections for the uh, party that's in the White House, it's pretty much guaranteed. The question is how much, and I I'm hopeful that we can get at least a 20 to 30 seat majority so we can really uh, get some good things done. And again, so the, the, the exciting thing about the Modernization Committee is that the next speaker will be able to implement a lot of these changes that we're, rec we're, we're recommending. So I'm planning to, to, to create a package that is ready for the next speaker. Um, and now if that speaker's a Democrat, I hope that, I hope that speaker does it, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident it's gonna be a Republican and his name's Kevin McCarthy. Let me ask um, you one, one last question. Uh, all right, obviously, last question. Uh, <laughs> I'll make that decision here, but let me tell you this. Congresswoman Liz Cheney says, anyone who challenges the 2020 election results should be disqualified from running in 2024. Are you qualified for 2024? Um, yeah, yeah, I am. And, you know, I think Congressman Cheney's uh, got a lot of ideas. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, anyone that doesn't see the unconstitutional changes to the election laws of certain states and just wants to say that was OK, you, you, you can't a judge can't change election laws in South Carolina. We actually uh, the General Assembly appropriately changed the election laws to make them covid friendly. A federal judge overturned them because a bunch of Democrats came in and said, well, we need to have, you know, all of this nonsense that decreases confidence in the outcome of the election, makes it easier to vote without an ID, which is ridiculous. Uh, the state appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in the state's favor and undid the federal judge's order. That's what should have happened. That's what happened in South Carolina. And that's why we didn't have any issues with the confidence in our election outcome. But guess what? We didn't get to the Supreme Court before the election in Georgia, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona. All these states had unconstitutional changes to the election laws. So I have no problem uh, fighting for election integrity. Um, well, and what? I think anybody that doesn't, anybody that, that has a problem with that, I, I have an issue with them being qualified to run. <laughs> what type of bill will you put forward? I'm, I'm really late, um, bro. You, yeah, you were supposed to get five minutes. Here we are, at fifteen. So thank you so much. Um, but what type of bill will you put? For, what type of bill will you put forward to stop I'll, this from the, in the future? So the federal government doesn't need to have any role in uh, state election laws, and judges don't need to have any role in state election laws, and random Democrat attorneys from Washington D.C. do not need to have any input on the election laws of South Carolina. That's that's the end of it. So South Carolina is going to protect its own its own election laws. Georgia is going to protect its own election laws. Arizona is going to pr protect its own election laws. But I'll do everything I can to make sure that we don't have big money coming from D.C. to try to change states election laws in the weeks before the election, because that creates distrust in the process. And that's what we got to avoid. I got to go. Hey, great. Thank you. For you. Your, thank you yeah. Thank you for your time on Quentin's full subs, Congressman Timmons. Yep. Take. Thank you.